Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Maria Hernandez Ojeda. I am vice chair of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives, and I teach Spanish language and literature at Hunter College. On behalf of ALVA, thank you to everyone who is attending this event. We are proud to begin the Perry Rosenstein cultural series with the screening and discussion of Invisible Heroes, African Americans in the Spanish Civil War, a film by Jordi Torrent, who is here with us today. Thank you to the panel, incredible panel, for joining the discussion. And also, thank you so much to Lindsay Griffiths, who will serve as moderator. Events like this are made possible only by your generous contributions. So please consider donating to ALBA at alba-valve.org backslash donate. Uh, Dennis is posting this link right now in the chat. Also, please note, this is important, um, that we will record today's event for future viewing. So if you don't wish to be recorded, you should turn off your camera. Now I will introduce Lindsay Griffiths, today's moderator. Lindsay is a PhD candidate in the departments of English and African American Studies at Princeton University. And she holds a BA in English Literature and Spanish English Translation from Hunter College. Lindsay is also the translator of Burp, Adventures in Eating and Cooking by Spanish author and journalist Mercedes Cebrian. Additionally, she is the co-translator of the forthcoming English translation Uno Nunca Sabe Por Qué Grita La Gente by Mario Michelena. Lindsay, thank you so much for being here today and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much to Alba for having me today and a special thanks to Maria, who was one of my favorite Spanish literature professors back in college. Um, so I have the honor of introducing our wonderful panelists. First, we have Jordi Torrent, co-director and producer of Invisible Heroes. Jordi is an award-winning media maker. He has written, produced, and directed feature narrative films, documentaries, and television programs. After obtaining a degree in philosophy at the University of Barcelona, Jordi Torrent conducted his graduate studies in Paris at the Sorbonne University in film aesthetics and at the École Pratique de Hautes Études in anthropology and filmmaking. He has served as media curator at Exit Art in New York, media educator consultant for the Department of Education of New York City, and co-director of Overseas Conversations a series of international conferences focusing on youth, media, and education. Jordi Torrent has published articles at El País, Liberation, El Mon, Video Actualidad, Casablanca, and Europe Now, among other publications. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so pleased to have you with us today. We also have Timothy V. Johnson, Timothy V. Johnson is the editor of the academic journal American Communist History and serves on the editorial board of Science and Society. He is a librarian, a journalist, a scholar, and an activist. He has worked as a librarian at Case Western Reserve University, at Northwestern University, at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and recently retired from New York University as the director of the Tamament Library and Robert F. Wagner Archives where he also directed the Center for the Study of the Cold War in the United States. We're also so pleased that you could join us today. And last but not least, we have Robin D.G. Kelly. Robin Kelly is a member of ALBA's honorary board. His prolific writing and research has explored the history of social movements in the United States, the African diaspora and Africa, as well as music, visual culture, contemporary urban studies, poverty studies and ethnography, colonialism and imperialism, organized labor, Marxism, nationalism, and many other topics. He co-edited This Ain't Ethiopia, But It'll Do, African Americans and the Spanish Civil War. His books include Race Rebels, Culture, Politics, and the Black Working Class, Freedom Dreams, 
the Black Radical Imagination, and the prize-winning Thelonious Monk, The Life and Times of an American Original. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for joining us as well. And thank you to all of our illustrious guests for being here and during Black History Month especially, so we can discuss invisible heroes, African-Americans in the Spanish Civil War. So we hope that everyone had a chance to watch the film beforehand. Um, and before we move into questions, we are going to um, show a short trailer just to refresh everyone's mind about the film. La presencia de personas de color en la lengua ayudaba a dar una imagen plástica de solidaridad, de igualdad de las razas. We arrived in Abbasetti sometime about noon time. I first met a young man from Brooklyn named Walter Garvin. Walter Garland was uh, one that I knew back in New York. Uh, he was from Brooklyn, and uh, he had, one had already been at the front and was wounded. There's a valley in Spain called Jarama. It's a place that we all know so well. Han representado un tipo de solidaridad internacional que ha sido muy raro. When Oliver Law was named commander of the Abraham Lincoln Battalion in 1937, in that same year in Mississippi, two black men were lynched in the United States of America. We were the first. We were integrated. He says, my name is Langston Hughes. And well, I almost fell over, you know, and began to talk about how long he had been in Spain and how long I had been and... It was there that we offered our manhood where so many of our brave comrades fell. What do you have Paul Robeson? No, Paul Robeson, Robeson, the great cantante, eh, actor, eh, activist, political, Afro-American. Went all over Republican Spain, he sang several times over national radio, including a famous broadcast at Teruel, where the, the story is that the, that the firing stopped for a couple of hours while both sides listened to the concert. Madrid, que bien resistes. Madrid, que bien resistes. Madrid, que bien resistes, mamita mía. Los bombardeos, los bombardeos. Ni uno se dirige a él, y Hemingway, que es americano, el otro, a uno que está en la guerra. Es negro, es chofer, ¿para qué le van a preguntar? Y esta es la invisibilidad. We are proud of the Lincoln Battalion and the fight for Madrid that it made. There we fought like true sons of the people as part of the 15th Brigade. Thank you. This documentary does such great work in preserving and communicating a, a very important piece of history. I want to invite the panelists just to say a few words before we get into questions um, about the film. Um, we can start with Jordi. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, no, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lindsay, and thank you to Alba and all the panelists and obviously 
all the, I see 2009 people are now connected with us. So thank you very much for your interest and for, um, well, uh, th this actually, I have to also give credit to Alfonso Domingo, who is the co-director and, and co-producer with me of the documentary, and Amiria Sentis as well, who was also one of the producers. Um, for, for me, it was really, I, I think I mentioned before, the whole story started in 1986. Uh, in the fall of 1986, walking down on Broadway around uh, just south of uh, Union Square, I saw this uh, all black gentleman uh, with a small table selling a book. I just walked by and then I saw the book and I look at the title and he said, Mississippi to Madrid. Uh, all the books on the table were only one book, was Mississippi to Madrid. And um, so I stopped, of course, and uh, I spoke to, the, to that uh, gentleman, it was James Yates. He was the author of the book. He had self-published the book uh, and I bought the book and I was immediately interested. So I contacted him and said, listen, let's, let's do something about it. This is an incredible story. It's a story that I never heard about. I mean, I knew uh, obviously a little bit because at the time, you know, it's not that we knew that much about the Spanish Civil War, even in Spain. It's a, it's a theme that people of my generation has really always been in the background, not talking too much about it. But, um, but I even knew less about uh, black volunteers from America coming to fight in Spain. So I was totally fascinated. And I was fascinated by James Yates, who was a truly, truly a gentleman, a really wonderful person. So I was honored to meet him and to interview him and to finally, uh, many years later, have this documentary out. So thank you again. Wow, what an encounter. Thank sure. you for sharing that, yeah. Um, Robin, if you have any introductory words for us. Sure, just, just a few words. I'm very happy this film is out. I remember Jordy working on it a very long time ago, um, a very long time ago. In fact, you know, my my relationship with this this scholarship and with the archives goes back to like 1990, and you know, the study of African Americans basically risking and in many cases losing their lives to fight fascism abroad because they were convinced that Spain would be the graveyard for fascism uh, everywhere. Fascism, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, but fascism also in the United States, whether we're talking about Alabama, Mississippi, or whether we're talking about you know Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles. Um, and so it's a really amazing story. And I'm surprised to this day how few students know anything about it, um, especially now when we're facing another sort of continued threat of fascist insurgency, um, not just in the United States, but all over with authoritarian regimes. And the lessons that we get from the film is how to fight fascism. And how to fight fascism requires collective acts of struggle. Um, it means not being in isolation, not being a single being, you know, uh, by yourself, but what it really means to to risk your lives, not just for something for yourself or even for what you perceive to be your people, but for humanity as a whole, you know? So the film's very important. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you for reminding us of the contemporary relevance of this film. Thank you for your words. Timothy, I'd like to invite you to say some words. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, I met James Yates briefly. I used to, in the late, 1980s, I used to work on 23rd Street, and he used to be there usually between 7th and 8th Avenue selling copies of his book all the time in the summer. I think that's the first time I encountered his book is, is buying a copy from it. Um, I'd like to thank Alba for sponsoring this program. I thought the film was great. I saw it years ago at a special showing at the Schomburg Library in Harlem, uh, which got a good audience and uh, appreciative audience. And then I also like the idea that they kind of hung the narrative on James Yates because his uh, travels kind of mirror the movement of the African-American people from the South under conditions of what anybody would call fascism in terms of a lack of political, social, economic rights 
to the north in the late 20s, 1930s, where there's a crashed economy and there's increased labor mobilizing and a growing left. And he kind of get, gets involved in, in all of that and then ends up going to Spain to same, fight the same kind of fascism that was actually entrenched in the land that he eventually came from. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. I want to invite the audience to drop any questions that you have in the chat and we'll be monitoring them and I'll be inviting you to unmute yourself and ask them when your turn comes. Um, but first, I'd like to ask a question of my own, if I may. Um, in the documentary, there's a, a, a talk of the moment when Mussolini invades Ethiopia and how it's, it's marked as a kind of spark for African Americans in particular to join the fight against fascism. So I wanted to ask if any of the pal panelists could talk about the significance of Ethiopia, not only in mobilizing the African American community against fascism, but also just in the black imaginary in general as a symbol. Right, um, I'll jump right into this question. I think it's the, the critical question. Um, in fact, in the documentary, I think I comment on it. Um, and, you know, let me just say that the essay that I wrote, the first essay um, was, the title was, this ain't Ethiopia, but it'll do. And that line actually comes from a short story written by Oscar Hunter, who was one of the volunteers uh, out of Chicago who fought, uh, African-American who fought in Spain. And he wrote this short story called 700 Calendar Days. And one of the characters, this wounded black soldier explains why he volunteered. He says, I wanna to go to Ethiopia and fight Mussolini, the same Ethiopia, but it'll do. And so if you actually looked at the defense of Ethiopia after Italy invaded in 1935, there was like massive black mobilization or groups like, you know, Pan-African Reconstruction Association. They claimed to have mobilized across the country about 12,000 volunteers who were ready to go to Ethiopia and fight um, Italy, um, fight Mussolini's troops. Uh, the Garvey I, Black Legion mobilized about 3,000. They were training black men in upstate New York for that very purpose. And they were all ready to go and then Haile Selassie was like, yeah, come on. And then of course, pressure from the US said it's impossible. And that's why they didn't go. Uh, two African-Americans did go, um, Herbert Julian and John Robinson, uh, both were involved with the Ethiopian Air Force for, for what it was. Um, and the other thing I just wanna mention, you know, of course, Ethiopia in the black imaginary is very important. There's biblical significance from Psalm 68 in the Bible where Ethiopia shall stretch forth their arms. Uh, there's the significance of Ethiopia being the only um, uh, African nation not to be colonized. Uh, of course, there's a complicated story around that we don't have time to go into, but there was some pride in Ethiopia. The, the Abyssinian Baptist church <laughs> was all about, you know, recognizing Ethiopianism. Uh, so the significance of it historically for black people is very, very important. And for the communist party, and we'll probably get into this, it became important because a lot of the black communists, especially in Harlem, uh, who ended up you know, mobilizing in support of Spain, began their work as part of the Provisional Committee for the Defense of Ethiopia. And um, it's a very tricky story, which I don't want to get into right now, but there was some question about the Soviets' um, commitment to Ethiopia versus any place else because of various things we could talk about. But it's, it's extremely important and inseparable. Uh, and I should say one more thing, um, at least a dozen Ethiopians fought in Spain, you know, volunteered to go to Spain. Um, you know, so the, the connections run very, very deep. Very interesting, okay. And any of the other panelists have anything to respond to this? Yeah, I just want to add also, if you look at the African American press, I mean, they see the connections or saw the connections between the fight in, in Ethiopia and, and the fight in Spain. And if you just do a search of the black press, there's hundreds of articles uh, that are written. The Associated Negro Press had coverage of it. The Baltimore Afro American uh, had coverage of it. And of course you can see through the, um, film that Paul Robeson going there, Langston Hughes going there, 
there were always articles in the black press written about their activities there. And at one point, um, Langston Hughes, Robeson, and I forget who the third person was, uh, had a, a live radio transmission from Spain during the war uh, that was listened to in all across the country, but particularly in the African-American community because of the people who uh, were on the transmission. Okay, uh, this you. Just want to mention, obviously, the, the ones who have seen the documentary and as Robin was saying, you know, it's, it's pretty featured, but this is, a, this is actually a, a chapter of a world history that actually I wasn't that aware of, actually. This is something that uh, in a way through researching for the documentary and then uh, finding Robin's book uh, with the, you know, the, the, study, oh, the, the article, the story titled This Ain't Ethiopia We Will Do, um, opened, opened the, the, this chapter and understanding. Um, then in a way it's a little bit what the documentary is trying to do, what the documentary is trying to do is like discussing something that is of, I believe, of capital importance, not only in American culture, not even in, in, in African-American culture, but actually in world history, uh, that, that we don't really know much about it. And one of the ones that I didn't know much about it was Ethiopia. And, and then obviously James Witness, uh, Harlem rising up, you know, and protesting uh, the, the fascist invasion of Ethiopia, who, as, as, as Robin was saying, it was the only country that wasn't colonized in, in, in Africa. So it was really like the, the last drop for the explosion of the social outrage. Thank you for these great answers. Okay, I think we can jump into questions from the audience. So um, we can take the question from Alejandro Batista Tejada. Um, you're gonna be invited to unmute yourself and you can go ahead and ask. Alejandro, do we still have you with us? Okay, okay, that's fine. I can ask your question for you. Okay, so Alejandro is asking, are there any other testimonies made by African-Americans apart from the one by Mr. Yates or Langston Hughes' autobiography? I, I think yes. I, I'm muted already, but- Oh, okay. No, no, thank you. Thank you for, you know, passing yes. my, my question. Yeah, well, I could jump in real quickly. Yes, there are. The, the book that's, that's actually out of print, unfortunately, by Danny Duncan Collum, um, is, has a lot of testimony that are from uh, a couple of sources. One, oral interviews by many of the volunteers, people like Oscar Hunter, Admiral Kilpatrick, Lucia McDaniels. I mean, there's a bunch of people, and Solaria Key herself, who was the one woman and a nurse who went also has left quite a bit, both in terms of interviews and other writings. Um, and, you know, there's also, you know, um, an unpublished uh, a book by Vaughn Love that has never, I've never been, I've been trying to get a publisher interested in it, where he tells his whole, it's an autobiography, tells his whole story, as well as his experiences in Spain. Um, Oscar Hunter, who has a background uh, as a writer, this is someone who, you know, somehow managed to get a college education coming out of a working class background and basically being an orphan and hung out in the John Lee clubs. He wrote short stories. He wrote a lot articles for the Daily Worker. Uh, some of those articles actually do tell the story. And then of course, it's Harry Haywood, who in his autobiography, Black Bolshevik, talks about his experience there. Although I should say with a grain of salt that Haywood was a complicated figure as a a leader in the Communist Party, but someone who many of the other Black volunteers didn't think very highly of because he wasn't really on the front lines, but he was a symbolic figure who, like a lot of communist leadership, was good at disciplining other people, but you know, not necessarily good at going out there and fighting. Um, and then Milton Herndon, you know, is another one who was Angel Herndon's brother, was killed in Spain. This story of Oliver Law. I mean, there's so many people who've left behind some testimony and it, you know, the, the best we have is that book, which was published a long time ago that really gathers some of it up. Um, yeah, any other panelists responses? Okay, all right. We have a question also from 
Christine Stanfield, you should be um, welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Hi. Um, hi, Jordy. Um, I was interested, the, the film is kind of insular that you, we, we see African-Americans um, integrated into the um, Abraham Lincoln Brigade, which is obviously a group of exemplary humans. What about other, um, the Spanish population thinking of the different kinds of factions of, um, I don't know, ordinary people um, and also anarchists and communists and socialists, how did they greet uh, and, I don't know, interact with um, the African-Americans who were there? That's my question. Yeah. Hi, Chris, how are you? Nice seeing you. Good, thank you. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, uh, all what I can say is what uh, I read and, and also what James told me. Um, uh, he was openly uh, greeted uh, without uh, racism, uh, uh, whatever he went. Very often, actually, he went to places, to towns where uh, he was the first black person these people saw. I mean, so, so he was kind of a bit of a, of a, of a strange figure, strange person uh, coming up, but uh, he, he was very much welcome. He even says that in Spain is the first place that I felt free. He was able to just to move around. Now, when it comes to the complexity of the Spanish Civil War, that's a whole other complexity. I mean, it's like, you know, the communists, the anarchists, boom, Andre Unin, Stalin, the uh, Hitler, Franco, Mussolini. I mean, it was a mess. It? And, and it, that's, that's a whole other story, which uh, the film itself, the documentary, we don't really get because I think it's a, it's a whole other complex. The, the, com the political complexities uh, of the Spanish Civil War uh, are, are quite complex and, and, you know, forever. Most, some, those of you who know a little bit, he, they, you know the, what happens in uh, May, of 1937, the communists and anarchists fighting in Barcelona, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's that much complex. But it, when it comes to how blacks were received, uh, I think they were they were received with open harm and very much welcome. Um, can I jump into this question? Um, actually, tying both the question to another question that came up, which is about um, the role of the North African soldiers. Uh, you know, which is also tied to the question of the internal politics of the politics on the ground. And it's, it is, Jordy's actually right, absolutely right. It's very complicated because on the one hand, imagine what it meant for uh, black volunteers, many of whom came out of the CP, had been in the CP for a long time. I mean, they weren't new uh, to that particular stream of the left, but also they're facing uh, a Republican popular front government that doesn't seem to be moving in the direction of land reform. It doesn't I mean they're, they're like, say, we fight the war first and all the, the anarchists, the struggle in Asturias, the, you know, um, the struggle among in the Basque region uh, for autonomy, the struggle for autonomy in, in Catalonia, uh, the struggle for, especially for land reform itself is something that, that black soldiers, black activists are like, yes, that's is something that we're thinking about in terms of the United States. And what they saw was the Republican government reluctant to do that. So there were some battles, real debates within the circles about which way to go forward, you know? Um, and, 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 you know, if you were in the CP orbit, you weren't gonna identify with the Puma, the anarchists, because they were considered, you know, persona non grata in some ways, yet there's a political identification with what they're calling for. Now, in terms of the role of North Africans, this is so, this is so critical because there was racism in Spain, you know, straight up. I mean, it's not like, I mean, Langston Hughes wrote about, you know, and, and some of the volunteers saw the, the, the racist images of North African troops, you know, who were seen as potential, like 
rapists and violent and they're the threat. In other words, there was a kind of Republican, it's not universal, way of painting uh, Franco's troops as basically being led by these infidels, um, black troops from North Africa. And so people felt that. And Lucio McDaniels talks about how he'd have to go to a place and for him, it wasn't like, oh, I'm so fascinated that you're black. The first thing he got was, are you a Moor? I mean, the, 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 he had to like defend himself saying, no, no, I'm on the other, I'm on the other side. Uh, and that brings me to one last thing that I just think is worth talking about. And that is, and again, forgive me, people are gonna be mad at me, you know, because I'm critical of some stuff, but the Republican government had an opportunity to undercut Franco's troops by simply um, declaring uh, independent Spanish, Spain's colonies in Morocco. So if they had pushed for independence, for decolonization, then that would have completely undercut Franco's army. But they didn't do that. There were black activists and other leftists who were saying, you know, really you should consider this as an option. Instead, what the uh, Caballero uh, regime or, or, or um, government did was they offered territorial concessions to France and Britain, you know, making some deals around colonies in exchange for their support. So imagine what it meant for, for revolutionary African-Americans on the ground who are anti-imperialists to see these machinations operating. So yes, there's something beautiful about what happened in Spain, but when we get down to the ground, there's some complications that we have to really grapple with and understand. And I'm not saying that all black volunteers agreed with that position. Some of them felt like you've got to fight the war first and we'll solve everything else later. That wasn't, that was a real serious debate. But in the end, we got to deal with the way that uh, the failure of anti-imperialism, the failure of land reform, the failure of revolutionary politics on the ground also shaped the perception of what was possible uh, in Spain under Republican government. Thank you for that. Yeah, just a quick, a, a quick, uh, absolutely, Robin, and it's, it's, it's great that you bring upon kind of the, the in any case, on Franco's side, there was the Spain colonialist army who was North African and actually Morocco itself sent soldiers. So, and those are the blacks, but when the, the Spanish reacting to them, I think was beyond the color of the skin is, is the complications of Spain as a Catholic country. And, and it's kind of like they, they were Moors, they were, they, they, were not, they were not Christians. So that becomes, you know, it's uh, like everything else, it's, 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 it's complex, but, but, um, but yes, uh, there, there was obviously, I think that racism was there, but I think that black Americans who were recognized as black Americans were welcome. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question from Peter Stansky. Welcome you to ask. Oh, thanks. Uh, uh, I'm just curious, uh, I, I guess Jody was the maker of the film. Uh, could you say something about both the mechanics and the challenges of making the film? Because I would gather that it was issued in 2015, but uh, obviously lots of the interviews uh, took, uh, took place years before. And, you know, just a, a sense of, you know, the challenges uh, of, and the mechanics of making, making this terrific film. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, well, you know, money is always, is always the issue, you know, finding the money to, to, to make it. Um, so I really started uh, in uh, 87 and 87, 88. I was actually, that's probably those 87, 88, 90, uh, but 87, 88, 89, those, those that two, two, three years were the years that I did most of the interviews with James itself, actually. So most, most of the things that you see in the documentary of James is 88, 89, uh, mid 87. So those, and with that material, I actually, I, I uh, submitted for proposals to make a documentary and uh, it did not happen. I wasn't able to raise money and funds to do the documentary. 
Um, then uh, I, you know, I produced and directed other films, other projects came along, James died. Uh, so things kind of were put on, on standby. And then uh, in the early 2000s, that's when I said, well, you know, I, there is all this material, I have to do something. Let me try it again. And then I did some other interviews. That's when I interviewed Robin uh, and Paul Robin Jr. And other of the interviewers were actually done on the early 2000s. And I, um, I, try, I again tried to raise funds and I was not able. So I'm a, I'm a terrible fundraiser, as you can see. So uh, I, I said, well, what can I do? Uh, let me put this on hold. And, and, and then I produced and directed other projects. I was involved in other uh, initiatives. Uh, and then uh, something happened in, in 2013, I think, that a friend of mine who publishes uh, books on uh, American, Black American literature uh, in Spain, um, uh, who's one of the producers of the documentary, Mireia Sentis, she said, you know what? I just found this book, Mississippi to Madrid, that is a great story, and I want to publish it in Spain. I said, I know James Yates. I mean, I met him. So, so then I said, oh, great. So, so then she put me in contact with Alfonso, who is the other co-director in Spain, and then we put all the our elements together, and finally we were able to raise uh, some funding to produce the documentary uh, out of the Spanish Ministry of Culture. Great, thank you for that. We have another question sort of related to the conversation we were having before about racism. Um, this question comes from Dina, I invite you to ask. Hi, I think Robin did a beautiful job of answering that question before I asked it. Um, I grew up, I, my father-in-law was in the, in the Lincoln Brigade and my parents were communists. And the, the racism, for example, a homophobia in the Communist Party, even as a child, I knew something was not right. Um, and so then when I grew up, even with the music that was so anti-Moor, anti-Morocco, and something didn't feel right. And, I'm, and you answered it. I have nothing else to ask about it. It was really brilliant. Thank you. OK, great. Um, just give us one moment. We have a question from Tybalt Cheriton. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, and thank you for a great documentary. The, the question was already uh, partially um, answered, but just in case uh, the panelists want to add something. Um, this was really a topic that I never really heard about or even thought about. And I'm very grateful to the filmmakers for bringing light to this topic. And I'm just wondering, uh, while making the documentary, how much, uh, how much work were they able to find on this specific topic, whether it be uh, literature, but also films and that type of thing? I, I wonder if they were able to find a lot because, uh, yeah, it seems like the topic hasn't been covered so much. So I don't know, just in case they want to add something. Hey, Thibault, how are you? <laughs> So, um, well, actually, uh, you know, uh, as Robin says, there is quite a bit of material, but, but I think it, it's really under piles of other material. So you need to do almost a, it's an archeological job. Um, we did a lot of research uh, on, on, uh, on the press. Uh, obviously on the archives and the Tamman time archives as well, but then also on the press. And then that's where we uh, found a, a lot of, uh, of material on Spain, but also on Ethiopia. Um, not, not much visual there are, but this kind of very standard visual of the Spanish civil war. And then a couple of frames here and there of, of with, a, with a, a, a black man but just not really being featured. Uh, aside from some photos with uh, obviously Oliver Law, which is Oliver Law 
became the, the commander of the Lincoln Brigade. So then he's more featured in some of the photos, but even him, I can, I don't remember having find actually, actually documentary footage, like footage where he's actually moving, moving pictures for, uh, footage with Oliver Law himself. So it, it, it is, uh, it, it, it is a job of archeological job really to find it. Uh, there are some very good archives, but that is uh, not easily uh, accessible. Even the books that Robin is mentioning, actually some of them I don't even know that they existed actually. So um, I don't know if Robin want to maybe mention more about that. Yeah, actually I, I just a couple of things. I want to use the opportunity to to promote one of my students, Javier Munoz, who's actually writing a dissertation on the topic and of, of, of the black world in the Spanish Civil War. And he's actually done research in the Spanish, in archives in Spain, as well as archives that are connected to uh, Morocco. So he's looking at the, the North African troops in their role because he found interesting kind of contradictions and intentions uh, within the Army of Africa. And so, you know, there's more work that's yet to be done that's really coming out. And, you know, one of the limitations with some of the scholarship is that the Spanish language scholar, the Spanish language sources weren't really central in the body of work that's available. What's great about the film is that you actually do deal with, you know, um, Spanish scholars, uh, Spanish intellectuals, and, and, you do, and you go back to Spain to look at some of this stuff. And so there's a lot from the Spanish perspective where the archives would be really helpful to really tell a much richer story. And I think the film begins to do that. Great, thank you. We have a question from, from one of the four or five Davids on this um, chat, but your name is just David, no last name. Um, please go ahead and ask. Oh yeah, my question is for uh, uh, Dr. Kelly. I've read his fantastic uh, biography of Thelonious Monk, which I just happened to pull off my bookshelf. And I'm curious if he can connect his scholarly, scholarly work in uh, jazz and in the Spanish Civil War together somehow that make some kind of intellectual sense? Uh, yeah, that's, I love that picture in the background too. <laughs> that's a, a, a great picture. What is a great day in Harlem. Um, yeah. yeah, well, the, the, just off the top of my head, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, I have to give credit, and here is where Mark Nason's wonderful book uh, on the Communist Party in Harlem is really important. Uh, you know, when when there was a, a mobilization, and, and Tim said this as well, when there was a mobilization within the black community, especially in Harlem, in Chicago, uh, around support for Spain, who were the first people to come out? The musicians. Cap Calloway did benefits. Uh, Duke Ellington did benefit. Count Basie did a benefit. Ella Fitzgerald, I think, sang. Um, and they were raising money. That usually it was like the, the Spanish milk fund, you know, for children, but they were raising money to, to, to to basically defend Spain in Harlem. Uh, and those entertainers were very, very important. Uh, jazz artists. Um, certainly, you know, Paul Robeson, you know, is not really associated with jazz, but he's someone who's very, very much uh, identified with and supportive of the music and his presence, uh, you know, connected the kind of black entertainment world, uh, the black populace, with events in Spain in a way that no other person uh, really did as much as, as Paul Robeson. Uh, so that's one way uh, to think about it. What I don't know, which is a really great question, is to what extent was Spain in the Spanish Civil War a source of inspiration uh, for composers uh, coming out of the jazz tradition writing music? Um, you know, the, the Communist Party was able to recruit a number of Black musicians. Um, Dizzy Gillespie talks about this. Um, some were, were dedicated to the party. Others, you know, felt like if I had a union card or a membership card, rather, I could get all these gigs doing benefits for the party. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, musicians, the jazz world was always like 
I, you know, always aware, conscious of the international situation. And so the fact that they came out in such large numbers to support uh, the, the Republic, I think is, is probably the best connection I can make uh, with respect to the music. Thank you. If I can... Uh... You're still muted, Jordy. Okay, now, th uh, thank you. Uh, now, just to jump quickly on that, uh, there is a, a, a thesis of a friend of, uh, of ours called uh, Jazz During the Spanish Civil War. Uh, I'm just gonna get the, her name is uh, Barbara Santana McGill. Barbara Santana McGill, you can Google and it will come up. Uh, she wrote a thesis on jazz during the Spanish Civil War uh, in Spain. Uh, and it, the ones of you who are interested in this topic and this music, you will find her research and her thesis uh, very uh, inspiring. Yeah, also, also just to uh, add one note to something that Robin said, that a lot of the uh, musicians in a time period were very close or friendly to the left. Um, and of course, the left and the Communist Party in particular was very popular in Harlem in, in that period. And in Tamament, we have posters of, for example, Charlie Parker playing a um, fundraiser for uh, Ben Davis, who was a uh, communist councilman from uh, Harlem represented in New York City Council. Great. We have another question that looks like it might be right up your alley too, Timothy. Um, <laughs> this question is from Margaret Russell. Hello, sorry for the delay. And thank you for a wonderful documentary. I and probably a number of other people were very intrigued by Solana Kea's story and want to know more about uh, women um, who were volunteers at this time and also what, what became of um, Ms. Kea the rest of her life. Um, <laughs> offhand, I don't remember, but uh, Solaria Key, there's a couple of, of of women who are very well known, Slary Key being the most famous African-American woman. But uh, these people are very well known and if, actually you can Google her and her life stories in Wiki. And you can also go to the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives website, the organization's website, and you can search by name uh, for anyone and they have short biographies, including covering their time in Spain, but also, <clears throat> excuse me, also before and after that. So just quickly, um, um, instead of like the, the role of women during the Spanish Civil War, I would think, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that it was in the anarchist movement where actually were mainly women fighting with guns in the front. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's kind of uh, one of the things that I'm not sure how many women fighting with guns were in the actual brigades, but uh, some of you probably know better than, than I do, but in women's fighting in the front with guns with, within the anarchist. Yeah, I don't know of any women that actually engaged in, in um, the armed part of the fighting. Uh, the largest number of them uh, who volunteered were trained as nurses, and of course, that's what they did. There are several women who uh, drove trucks, which was as dangerous as being on the front, actually, since trunks were trucks were carrying wounded people and, and munitions and were likely to get bombed by the uh, Royalist Air Forces. Right. Um, in terms of the question of what happened to Solaria Key and what about the other Black women, as far as I know, I think there were actually a couple other Black women who also went to Spain, not so much as members of the brigade, but as social workers uh, and did that work. As, and with Solaria Key, I mean, she's, her story is interesting because she was recruited by a doctor. Um, she had some links but she, she's un, uh, very unlike some of the other volunteers. She didn't come out of the CP like as a leftist. 
um, Dr. Arnold da Donawa, who was the Dean of the dental school at Howard University, a Harvard graduate, uh, and um, himself a major like famous oral surgeon was head of oral surgery, he's African-American. And he actually recruited her and she was working at Harlem Hospital at the time, you know, uh, in a gig that she really wasn't crazy about. So that was very, very important for her. She comes back to the US and as far as I know, uh, became very much involved in social justice causes. So in some ways, um, and she lived quite a bit uh, long life. I can't remember when she passed away off the top of my head, but she did, um, uh, I mean, the, the Spain was a turning point for her in terms of really being kind of the anchor for her politics from that point on, you know, uh, and then she, you know, married and everything else. But, but, it's, but her story is, is, is amazing. Um, and she also became more than just, you know, one person volunteered. She became something of a spokesperson who was able to tell her story and really bring attention in the, in the 1960s and 70s around what happened in Spain because she talked to the press because she was kind of a celeb celebrated figure, you know, because of her work. Great. We have a question from Amy Bloom. Hi, thanks very much. Um, this kind of builds, this is great. Um, I actually haven't seen the very end of the documentary yet because um, I started a little too late, but um, this kind of builds on what was just said. And it's more about whether or not um, how people's relationships that um, maybe were created or strengthened during their work and their efforts in Spain, how that may have influenced when they came back and the beginnings of the civil rights movement and whether some of those relationships um, helped um, with that, um, both within the African-American community and also across the communities that were there and the people from different places, thanks. Okay, I, I feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> I didn't really want to answer this question, but <clears throat> that's, a, that's a fantastic question. Um, and without going into a lot of details, James Yates' story is very similar to a lot of people's story. That is, you come back, um, Yates was one who, uh, like a lot of the black men who fought, including people like James Peck, who was in the Spanish Air Force, um, they came back to a country that instead of embracing them for standing up to fascism, uh, labeled them premature anti-fascists, blocked them from getting jobs, um, blocked some from actually enlisting in the military during the Second World War when the U, I shouldn't say during, Second World War begins in Ethiopia, by the way, just to be clear. But they were, they were denied um, the right to enlist to fight on behalf of the country. Some, you know, not everyone, but some were. Uh, they were blacklisted. Um, there's a story that I write about in, in that article, uh, which again, is more like, it's like amplified version of what happened to, to Yates, where James Kilpatrick was one of the many, as Tim, Tim mentioned, Tim Johnson mentioned, uh, who were brought before the House Un-American Activities Committee and hounded. And he gives, I think, the greatest testimony, second to Paul Robeson, where he says, you know, I'm not taking the Fifth Amendment. I've been trying to get the 13th and 14th Amendment to work for me, you know, and the 15th Amendment. And, and his point was, look, you know, I live in a country where you're hounding me because I fought fascism, you know, because I fought fascism. I fought fascism before I went over there, you know, and this country's fascist. And so they paid a huge price for that. So here we are in 2021, we could talk about like how heroic they were and how they're invisible heroes, which is true. But then the country they came back to didn't treat them that way, you know? And, but they didn't give up. Many of them went on to be central figures in civil rights struggles, in labor struggles. They came out of labor struggles, they came back to labor struggles. Who was at the forefront of the massive strike wave uh, after World War II? A lot of veterans of the, of the Lincoln Brigade, you know? Who was fighting to half-heartly? Veterans of the Lincoln Brigade, 
you know, who's fighting on behalf of SCLC and SNCC in Mississippi and places like that? Same thing, you know? So there's a long legacy. And one last thing, just on a personal note, um, I, I didn't plan to write about this. I was recruited. I was recruited uh, by many people, Mark Crawford being one, who brought me to a meeting of Valve, the veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, who were, I and mean, these were uh, men who had such solidarity with one another, who were so invested in this story. They're like, we've got to size you up first before we even allow you to write anything. You know, we want to tell, to tell the truth about what happened. And the fact that they maintain ties with each other, even as some of them left certain circles in, 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 the, in the communist uh, party, they still maintain these tight ties. And that solidarity, you know, moved them through the rest for the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. And none of them actually stopped fighting. They were still fighting in the 1990s. You know, for justice, for race, racial justice, for economic justice. Um, when I met them back at those early meetings, you see. So it's a, it's a long and amazing story that goes even beyond that moment from 1936 to 1939. And also there's, because the veterans of the, they formed the veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade at some point after the war. Uh, and not only, as Robin said, were they active in the early parts and supportive of civil rights movements and all of that, but, and there's a lot of documentation in the Tamamis collections. They are also very active in a lot of the anti-interventionist struggles of the 1970s and 1980s against Nicaragua, what was happening in El Salvador, and, and the uh, movement struggles against apartheid, um, and there's hundreds of, of pictures of them with their banners at all these major demonstrations. So these guys, even up until their 80s and on, were marching in all of these demonstrations. Hey, thank you. So we have time for just one more question, um, but I do want to let everyone know that you can ask any unanswered questions in an email to Alba, um, and we'll be sure to drop that email address in the chat. Um, but the honor of asking the last question goes to Craig Lanier Allen. Craig, are you with us? That's the last question. It seems like it is. All right, well, we've rounded out the night. Um, thank you so much everyone for coming, for um, enjoying this wonderful documentary. And, and we thank our special panelists for sharing all of your wonderful knowledge um, about this incredible history that's so important not to lose sight of and not to lose at all. Um, I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you for joining us. I just want to say one thing if you, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, so just for those of you who have not seen the documentary yet, uh, the link that you have received and the password will be uh, functioning for uh, for a few more days, uh, probably around the 24th, February 24th. After that, we will change the password, but um, you can always purchase the, the documentary from ALBA. ALBA is, is uh, the distributor for North America. And those of you who are connected somehow with the uh, uh, libraries, uh, colleges, uh, universities, uh, etc. Um, it will be great to have to have it in the collection of those libraries so that other generations, other individuals will have access to this information. Alba is as well the distributor. So please feel free to connect with Alba and uh, purchase it and that um, that way that uh, chapter of American history, uh, lives on and uh, and creates more of these conversations. But thank you, thank you all of you, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, special thank you to Jordy, Torrent, to Timothy Johnson and to Robin Kelly. All right, good night everyone. Thank you.